Welcome to the latest episode of Timber Talks. Today we're here in Wales at Lake Vernwy. And this is a site where we work on behalf of a water company to try and improve water quality. And we're gonna be um, covering that in a case study that we're gonna be releasing soon. But today we're gonna to talk about timber, but we're also gonna talk about something that's really affecting the whole of the UK, isn't it? And that's larch and the disease. Can you talk about this site and also, why are we felling so much larch? Yeah, hi, Georgina. So, yes, as you said, we're, we're out on site. A forest that I've been coming to for 15, 16 years. We've been buying timber, well, for much longer than that uh, as a business, but certainly somewhere I've been familiar with in all that time. And as you've mentioned, larch and, and d disease within larch is becoming a real management issue on, on the site. So if we cast our minds back, um, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, we're talking about Phytophthora remorum, which is a, a pathogen, a, a, a disease that, that larch gets. And we've probably been dealing with this now in forestry for somewhere around 10, 12 years. It started in Southwest England. Um, and I remember looking at a stand of larch, the first one I saw that had been affected by Phytophthora uh, in a place called Lidford, Lidford uh, in, in Devon and has spread up through the whole country and we've now got outbreaks in Scotland, particularly in, in the west coast and uh, it's a notifiable disease and once a stand of larch gets Phytophthora we have to fell it. We get a, given a, 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 a license by the state and we have to comply with that in fairly short order, generally the, mo the longest we get is the growing season that, that we're in. Harry, tell me how, it, I know that you're actually it more in the harvesting side of things, but you were originally a forester. So when you first saw larch like wipe out forests that you know a lot of people made an effort with, how did that make you feel? Yeah, so um, it's quite emotional really when I, I think back, the, the, particularly at the first time we saw a stand in, in Wales. And I can remember, I knew, knew it happened down in South Wales in the valleys near Croiseru. Uh, but, you know, I was really quite upset when I saw it because I, I guess I was aware of all the hard work that generations of foresters had put in to establish these stands of timber. Larch is a species that's quite difficult to manage to get to a point where we produce some really good quality timber uh, from it. Uh, and you'll, you, you have to thin it, you have to work hard at it. Planting it's not, not, not always easy. And then to see all that work being wiped out by the onset of a disease is, is really, really very sad. Harry, tell us about the history of larch and larch disease. Yeah, so, so I mean, larch is, uh, was introduced uh, hundreds of years ago. It started off with European larch, and that was the sort of standard larch species we had. And, and then, more latterly, we introduced Japanese larch, which, as the name suggests, comes from the Far East. And ultimately, the two were planted together, and they hybridised and Blair Athol Estate in, uh, in central Scotland. Um, and so, l more latterly, we've planted hybrid larch or Japanese larch is far less stands of European larch about the place but it had become an important species uh, had the advantage that it would cope with some of the very poor soils that we tend to get in forestry and we could plant it as blocks either in mixture with spruce or as a part of pure blocks within spruce forest and it gave a great landscape diversity um, it, and when, when it's within a spruce block, you'll, you'll get in individual trees within that that create a bit of diversity within the stand. So you get the yellow colours as, as it loses the needles uh, and goes through that cycle. So it's, a, it's a, a, a very unusual as a conifer and it, it loses its needles every year. Sometimes when you work in these public forestry sites, it can look a little bit, what's the word we can use here, Untidy. Harry? Untidy. My wife would say untidy. Yes. 
So let's talk about the larch behind us. Okay. Let's talk a bit about public perceptions because a lot of people just think obviously when you see trees and they're all alive and vibrant, that's how nature is. But obviously there's different stories and things that does happen in nature, isn't there, Harry? Yes. So I mean, what, what we're looking at behind here is we're responding to a problem that we've been talking about earlier in the form of Phytophthora remorum. These trees are all diseased. To manage that disease, uh, we've had to stem inject them uh, to, to kill them standing, not something we want to do, but we've been served with a statutory plant health notice that means that we have to kill these trees to stop stop them spreading the disease, sporulating as we as, as we would say. We've we've then felled them to uh, stop them blowing over once once they've died, and then next year we'll come and extract this material. Now it's not really ideal forest practice, but we're having to respond to this this problem that's that and, and, and manage our way through it. So Harry, what are we doing to manage these public perceptions? So in this instance, we put up some information boards down at the bottom. We're having to divert people off some of the footpaths in, in this forest and to educate people, we're putting up notices explaining the forest operations that we're undertaking in these locations. So when this site is restocked, what does the future hold for this area? Okay, so the, the forest we're in, the, the, planted going on here since Victorian times and I don't know specifically about the stand behind us but it's probably the second or third rotation as we can say of trees that's gone on it. This site will be restocked probably next year once we've extracted the, the trees from there and the cycle of sustainable forestry will continue. Um, we'll plant, I'm guessing that will probably be Douglas fir and Sitka spruce and moist spruce, something like that going back on there. In 30, 40 years time we'll be doing the same thing. The forestry, uh, the state forestry arm overflies all the forests at the beginning of the growing season, sort of around this time, at, uh, early May, and it identifies from those, air, that, those aerial surveys potential infections. And they'll then ground truth those, that, so that means someone will walk out and have a look at the tree to check that, that, that it's potentially dying uh, from Phytophthora rather than some other issue um, and then at that point the grower will be issued with a statutory plant health notice which sets out the time over which they have to fell those trees typically it would be by the next growing season so if we were to be granted or issued with one now we'd have till next february march something like that to to fell it um, and and that then re requires quite a lot of effort and some very complex areas in forest where particularly where you've got the larch in intimate mixture with other species uh, there's, there's quite a lot of planning that be required there and it may indeed force the felling of the surrounding stands as well and, and why do we do that it's because it's maintaining the, our forest health our the integrity of of those forests Although we've fortunately yet to see the, the, the Phytophthora more in jumping from larch to other species, there's always that danger and it certainly will infect other trees around them um, and, it, and it can kill them. So I've seen understories below larch of sweet chestnut, ash, things like that being entirely killed because of the sporulation of, of, of the spores coming off the trees and just overloading the, the, the trees locally. We've seen examples of spruce being, being killed by, by that as well. Let's talk a little bit about how this has affected the market. So all that felling that's taking place across the country, what does that mean for the timber industry and sawmilling and everything? So it probably means that we're going to remove almost a whole growing stock of larch. I would have thought over from the country, probably over a period of 20 to 25 years. So we're at least doubling the production of larch that we've seen and locally it's been much greater than that. So it's meant that sawmills that perhaps haven't cut much larch have had to get used to producing much more. 
Uh, certainly our sawmill at Newbridge on Wye in Mid Wales, we're regularly cutting batches of larch that we perhaps wouldn't have done prior to this. There are opportunities within that. Larch is a much more naturally durable timber than some of the other ones that, that we cut, are cut, but it's only short term because we know uh, we know that we're not going to have a, an, an, an ongoing supply of larch because of the disease. So a lot of it goes into fencing. Um, that probably would be the main main application for it. Construction timber as well, and we have substituted it in, in there as well. And it also goes into pallet and packaging. What about areas like this, um, where we're working for a water company and we want to keep the water quality but we know there's a lot of larch to be taken out what are the considerations there well we'd need to plan the, the felling very carefully as as in do as indeed we do generally but in this case we've got an extra sensitivity that we've got a water catchment area for drinking immediately behind us so uh, the the company are measuring the quality of that water constantly and we, we ca cannot afford to have any runoff but in that's a principle that we apply to all our harvesting sites. So there's a high level of planning that goes into this. And water is just one of the many constraints that we have to consider and, and, and mitigate any, any potential issues. So what sort of species will replace larch, do you think, on a, like a site like this, for example? What's the best species to plant? So around us, they've obviously restocked some areas with Douglas fir. Um, perhaps on the more impoverished sites. I know they're, they're doing experiments with other species. Red cedar, which is a fairly well-established uh, minor species within forest. Serbian spruce, something we used to plant many years ago, and there's not been so much planting perhaps over the last 20 years, maybe even longer than that. Uh, and and forestry is certainly going through uh, a period of experimenting with a wider range of species to understand how it can replace some of the species that we're we're losing. Oh, tell us about your involvement in this project here at Lake Vernwe. In this project I'm the senior timber buyer um, so involved in all the harvesting work that goes on within within the estate. Tell us about some of the challenges of this site. Some of the difficulties range from public access, um, the water as you see this is the, the main reservoir here in front of us that feeds Liverpool. Uh, we have a water tower and a very old water system that cleans the water so we have to be incredibly careful for any particles or diffuse pollution that enters the, the reservoir. We've also got an involvement with RSPB which is one of the large stakeholders on the estate which is helpful for us um, knowing where any raptors or uh, birds of prey may be nesting so that gives us an insight, a uh, closer insight into the wildlife on the estate. What's the long-term plan for this site? Long-term plan is a 10-year plan being put in place by Till Hill, uh, which will be a diverse plan uh, which helps with the water quality, the management of the woodland, making the woodland sustainable from a commercial point, um, which also has stakeholders of RSPP looking at that, saying what's best for habitats, breeding birds, um, and also habitats. We now have pine martens on the estate, which again is, is another constraint, but also another positive new story around wildlife.